as a law student, I have two hats. My everyday hat for thinking through problems emotionally and my lawyer hat for thinking reasonably. Last winter, I chose the wrong hat when I took on one of the most daunting tasks of my life, driving in downtown Toronto during the holidays. My girlfriend wanted to see her first Christmas market, and I was determined to get her there. As we navigated our way through unfamiliar roads, I saw all kinds of mistakes. A car turned right when a sign clearly said, no right turns. That driver must have been so careless to break the rules like that. Then, another car merged into our lane, cutting us off at the last second. That driver must have been incredibly arrogant. After an hour of witnessing more incidents, I got frustrated. How frustrated? Forget this market. Let's go home frustrated. And then, on the way home, I made my own big mistake. I saw a pedestrian crossing the road and made a left turn, only narrowly avoiding them. They looked at me at that moment as if I was the worst driver on the road. And then at that moment, I put on my lawyer hat and I did what lawyers do best. I built a case for myself. If only they knew me. They would know I'm a good driver. They would know that they're wrong to think that I'm a bad driver based off the one mistake they saw me make, especially on unfamiliar, busy roads at night. I mean, we're all allowed one mistake. It wasn't until I got home that I realized if I had worn my lawyer hat the entire time, I could have made the same arguments for other drivers. By thinking like a lawyer, I would have been more compassionate towards their mistakes, and my girlfriend would have seen her first Christmas market. Since then, I've applied the lessons I've learned in law school outside of the classroom to be more compassionate towards others and myself. When you leave here today, you'll have your own lawyer's hat, and you'll know how to use it to build stronger, more compassionate relationships. Compassion, empathy, and sympathy are all building blocks of a strong relationship. Instead of discussing countless studies proving this point, I'll let you decide for yourself. I want you to imagine two coworkers who have worked together for years. One of them makes a mistake that causes problems for the entire team. When the other finds out, they have a choice. They can either act with compassion or without it. If they react with compassion, they might say something like, hey, I know you made an honest mistake and I know you're really hard on yourself. Let's work together to find a solution and move on. If they react without compassion, they might say something like, how could you be so careless? You're always making mistakes and you gotta get your act together. Which relationship do you think would improve the coworker's performance? Which reaction do you think would improve their feelings towards work? Which reaction would you want if you made a mistake at work? It's intuitive. Compassion leads to better relationships. But if it's intuitive that compassion leads to better relationships, then why did I struggle to show compassion for other drivers last winter? I wondered if I was the only one who struggled to show empathy. But as it turns out, I'm in great company. I want you to think about someone that you find unfavorable. Not just unfavorable, like a waiter who forgets to put ice in your glass, but very unfavorable. According to the Pew Research Center, in 1994, only 17% of Republicans found Democrats very unfavorable. Just 20 years later, that number has more than doubled to 43%. Nearly half of Republicans now find Democrats very unfavorable. And this isn't just a Republican problem. Over the same time period, the percentage of Democrats that find Republicans very unfavorable has also doubled. Clearly, there's an increasing trend in intolerance within the political sphere. Put another way, there's a declining trend in empathizing with other parties. Psychologist Lee Ross's term, the fundamental attribution error, refers to our cognitive bias to blame other people's actions on the kind of person they are instead of their circumstances. This is exactly the mistake I made 
when I blamed other drivers' errors on their ignorance and arrogance instead of the conditions of the road. No matter the cause, it seems that despite our innate ability to empathize, more and more people are struggling to do so. As a law student, I learned how to read, argue, and stay up late studying way past my bedtime. But one of the most important lessons that I've learned from law school is how to be more compassionate towards myself and others. By using these lessons and applying them outside of the classroom, I've been able to overcome some of the barriers to empathy that I've outlined for you today. And given the challenges and isolation that we face during the pandemic, it's more important than ever that we take these lessons and share them in order to revive and strengthen our relationships. One lesson that I've learned is that active listening can help you understand where others are coming from. Have you ever been the first person to ask a friend about their vacation? Have you ever been the 30th? Because this audience is filled with great people, who I'm sure are the first to ask about their friend's vacation, let me fill you in on what it's like to be person number 30. It is boring. Important details are forgotten or contradicted, and the person telling it, barely invested. As a student caseworker at the Queens Prison Law Clinic, I feel like person number 30 every time I interview a client. But not only am I not supposed to feel like person number 30, I'm not even supposed to be person number one. Instead, I'm supposed to feel like I was with the client during their offense. To do this, I have to put on my lawyer hat and become an active listener. Instead of asking yes or no questions, I ask questions that start with why or how so that they give detailed answers. Once they start talking, I make sure not to interrupt. I'll ask follow-up questions to help the speaker dive deeper into their own thoughts. And when they finish, I'll summarize what they said so that I understand them, but also so that they feel heard. For a moment in time, I relive their experience with them. The next time you, a colleague, or even a friend does something to upset you, put on your active listening lawyer hat. Become curious and start asking them questions. Let them tell their side of the story so well that you relive it with them. The purpose of this isn't necessarily to agree with them, but I'm willing to bet that if you took the time to understand where they're coming from, it would be easier to empathize with them, to forgive, to move forward. If you ever watched The Office, I'm sure you've already tried this. I mean, we empathized with Jim and Pam for three seasons while they emotionally cheated on their partners. There's a, show, there's a reason why shows like The Office set up those testimonials. It makes us more empathetic and turns us into active listeners. And we're not just frustrated with characters on a screen. One lesson that I've learned in order to have compassion towards other people and lower my frustration with them is by building the best case for them. In law school, we hold moot competitions, which are pretend court. Law students role play as legal counsel and argue on one side of a hypothetical situation. I've taken part in three mooting competitions and now you're about to take part in your first. The question is, is Austin a good driver? And you're gonna argue, of course, that Austin is a good driver. Take a moment and think of your best arguments for why Austin's a good driver. Make up facts if you have to. Now, imagine we're standing in front of a judge, and after you so elegantly presented your outstanding arguments, I walk up in front of the judge, and I say, <clears throat> Austin's crashed his car three times. Well, no matter how good your arguments were, they sound a lot less persuasive now. And I'm willing to bet that if you took the time to understand my arguments, and address those arguments, then the judge would understand as well why he should be, uh, agree with your, with your arguments as well. So, the next time a friend or colleague does something to upset you, put on your mooting lawyer hat. Take a moment and think of a reason why what they did upset you. Maybe they cancel on you at the last second. And if they cancel on you at the last second, then think, why did they cancel on me at the last second? Maybe they had an emergency, or felt sick, or 
are going through a breakup, instead of being mad at them, you're already worrying and empathizing with them. Ask yourself if you've ever canceled on someone at the last minute. If you have, could you be mad at someone for doing something that you've done yourself? By thinking like a lawyer and by making the best arguments for others, you can gain a deeper understanding of their situation and find common ground to build a stronger relationship. And these lessons aren't exclusive to empathizing with others. One lesson that I've learned in order to have compassion towards myself is through something called statutory interpretation. Rules seem simple, and I spend my days wishing they were. In law, though, we don't write the rules. We interpret them. And sometimes a rule is ambiguous. Take the famous example of a rule by H.L.A. Hart. No vehicles are allowed in the public park. No vehicles? Well, surely the rule means that no cars are allowed in a public park. But what about bicycles? Rollerblades? Toy cars? This is where statutory interpretation comes in. To understand a rule, lawyers can look at the words in the text. They can also look towards the purpose of the rule. For example, if the purpose of a rule is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then surely bicycles are not meant to be vehicles. Lawyers can also cite the rulemakers' discussions leading up to the creation of the rule. To do statutory interpretation correctly and accurately, you should look at all the things I've mentioned, because all those factors taken together will likely reveal the one true meaning of the rule and how it should be interpreted and what can be allowed in the park. And statutory interpretation isn't just applied to rules. We can also use it towards how we treat ourselves. We're our own worst enemies. And due to a cognitive bias called impact bias, we're especially good at overestimating how bad we'll feel based on one single event. I failed a test, I must be stupid. I've been broken up with, so I'm unlovable. I didn't get the job, I must be worthless. Does this sound familiar? One thing I've learned from doing statutory interpretation is that you can't judge the whole based on just one part. Life doesn't work like that. Imagine you graduate from university, and based on this monumental event, your friends and family might offer you congratulations and express excitement for your achievement. But your closest friend might recognize that graduation is actually a challenging event for you because you're struggling with uncertainty about your career path and financial independence. While the others may be happy for you, your closest friend might know that you're actually struggling and they might offer you support rather than just congratulations. To have more compassion towards yourself, put on your statutory interpretation lawyer hat. Think of your life as a whole before judging yourself based on one single part. So, start small. Wake up with the intention of only wearing your active listening lawyer hat. Then, when you wear that hat well, move on to your mooding lawyer hat. When you can balance both hats, then put on your statutory interpretation lawyer hat. By thinking like a lawyer, you only need to take small steps to make big improvements in your ability to empathize with yourself and others. And, at the minimum, it'll help you drive in downtown Toronto during the holidays. Thank you.